Are you a good or bad Christian? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the 7 Ways from Sunday podcast. I am Larry Stump, your host and brother in Christ. The purpose of our podcast is to edify and equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. You can find more biblical teaching and encouragement at 7waysfromsunday.com, 7waysfromsunday.com. What makes a good or bad Christian? I recently came across an article in my news feed with the title, A Bad Christian. At first, honestly, I just passed it by because I, I was thinking that it was just a hit piece, you know, a hit piece on Christianity again. We get so many of them, sad to say. But then, but then I felt compelled to go back and open it up. And when I did, that's when I found a topic worthy of our minds to think upon. It's a featured article entitled, A Bad Christian, by a lady named Hannah Falm. Now I should tell you, before we jump into this, what the point of it appears to be, and then we'll dissect her argument to see if we should take her at her word, or let's see what the Bible says, and how does it counsel us, because perhaps you're holding the same views as her. I hope not, but you could be. Sadly, I don't believe that Hannah is the only person, especially of the younger generations, that hold to the supposed logic of church just not being all that important. Not important or necessary in their thinking, if you're a Christian. And so that's why we need to think through her reasoning a bit and see how, and if, a big if, if it lines up with Scripture. And she begins her article with this statement, and I quote, I am faithful 100% to God. But that does not mean I have to be to an organized religion. End quote. Let's stop there. That should raise some flags in your mind already, shouldn't it? I wonder what constitutes faithfulness to Hannah. As we go through the article, we'll quickly observe that she doesn't think church is all that important, and she cites depression later on in her article as another reason to avoid what she has termed organized religion. She continues, what makes a good Christian? What makes a bad Christian? These good versus bad connotations with Christianity have been popping up a lot more, whether it's through social media, the church, or the people you surround yourself with. I consider myself a committed and dedicated Christian. But as someone who's also been labeled as a bad Christian, it's time to just put it all out on the table. Let's stop there. And Hannah puts it all out on the table, but it's a very short article, so it's not a whole lot. It's not really going to fill up our plate too much, dear Christian. So I think we can get through it. But she does have a valid point here, doesn't she? You just get on Twitter or Facebook, and you'll find out rather quickly how mean and judgmental some people can be. It's sad to say, and that includes some professing Christians. Sadly, we can add some churches to that because some churches have folk that exercise their gifts of judgmentalism and illegalism ugh, ugh, rather profoundly, don't they? But let's take some time to answer the question. What makes a good or bad Christian? Am I a good Christian because I attend church regularly or a bad one because I don't? That seems to be the point of her article. She continues. I think one of the most prominent reasons that I and many others have been given this label is because we do not attend church every Sunday. As a busy college student working part-time, my weekends are very valuable. Most of that time is filled with homework, studying, or writing lesson plans for the kiddos I student teach for. If I have extra time after that, and that's a big if, it's probably spent catching up on sleep. A lot of people have began to follow this trend, and in this ever-changing world, some people have found other things to do on the weekends rather than just go to church. Being religious means faith exists outside of the four walls of the church. Just because I don't always have time to go to church doesn't make me less faithful. Well, let's stop there. There is a lot. Folks, there is a lot to unpack from that paragraph. 
first off, she says she's labeled for not attending church regularly. And her, and her reason for that, her excuse, is busyness. Right? That's, that's her reason for absence. Because of college, tutoring, and, yeah, she said catching up on sleep. Now, we get it, right? There are seasons of life, seasons in our life, where we can't be at church every Sunday. We can't be at church when the doors are open all the time, right? But there are seasons of life. Sometimes there's a, a, a you know, an unavoidable shift change at work that we're going to have to be working Sundays for a while. Or life changes come you know, by taking care of parents or whatever else, a different job for someone else in our family or one of our spouses, whatever it is. Or just the need for more money at that time to honor God by paying our bills. We get it. There are seasons in life. But seasons of life are different than the practice of life. Do you hear what I'm saying? There are seasons of life which we get and we understand. They happen. And God is honored when we do what we need to do for his glory and for the benefit of those around us. But they shouldn't be the practice, the continued habit of our life. And that's the sense. I, I gain a couple senses from Hannah's article. That there's just this sense of, oh, maybe I'm wrong, you tell me. That underneath it all, these excuses just kind of get pushed off to the side. And there is this tension between her and perhaps the people she says she's representing against Christianity. I guess going to the church, at least that form of it, right? That, that's old, that's outdated. And as she said, there's other trends, other people are doing other things rather than just go to church on Sunday. Well, ooh, I just get a tone there. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. You let me know. But seasons of life, we understand. But that shouldn't make for our practice of life. Many other Christians are busy too. I know a lot of them. Maybe you do. Maybe you're one of them. But what makes those Christians different than Hannah or the one she's speaking for? What makes them different is that they prioritize corporate worship over other things on the Lord's Day. They, it's important to them. They make the time for it. They adjust their schedule for it and put worship, put Christ, put his church on top. Why? Well, I'll get to that answer in just a bit. So hang on. Third thing she says is other people follow that trend. To me, she seems to be justifying her argument based on what others are doing. <laughs> that made me think back to when I was a kid. And it made me think of when did that argument ever, ever, ever hold up? Mom, why can't I do? You fill in the blank. Everybody's doing it. <laughs> Remember that old line? How did that go for you? Fourth thing she says is being religious extends beyond the church wall. Honestly, that one and the previous one are the two that concern me the most. Why? Because I gather from her article, well, at least how it sits with me, is that the real issue, the real issue here is not what other people think. But to me, it seems that Hannah has a settled opinion of what church is and its value in her own heart. She goes on listing another reason she's deemed as a bad Christian, and I quote it. Another reason for this bad Christian label it's because of the struggle with mental health. I, like others, struggle with depression and anxiety. I have been to plenty of churches where they either just don't acknowledge it or it's a sin and we're terrible people. To have someone preach that my chemically imbalanced brain, the way I was made, is a sin is just heartbreaking. They'll say things like, you just don't pray enough or you need to go to church more. First of all, you think I haven't tried those two things? Second, it is a medical diagnosis that usually needs medication, not more prayer time. Oh, do you see why I sense un underneath all this, undergirding this, is this attitude, right? Right? I don't need to pray more. I don't need more prayer time. It's medically induced. It's, it's, it's not a spiritual issue. I don't need God on this particular thing. Biblically, folks, we see that depression, it can be. It just can be a spiritual issue. Jonah, for example. Elijah as well in 1 Kings 19. King David, when not repenting of his sin against Bathsheba and everything that came out of that. But we also recognize that there are things that happen to people, car accidents, for instance, other physical issues that can cause cognitive problems or chemical imbalances, 
that do need, folks, they do need the help of a medicine to help keep things in tow. But, but, let me emphasize that, that is not always the case. In our Bibles, we see that these two things, depression and anxiety, are often a symptom of a heart problem, not a brain problem. And that's something that solid biblical counseling can help figure out. A good biblical counselor would advise you to get testing done so that medicine, if you need it, can be added to the counseling that's given, right? It's okay if it's needed. It just needs to be figured out so you can get the best care. And that doesn't then substitute the biblical counseling that you need for depression and anxiety. Now, I don't know if Hannah has gone this avenue or not, so I'm not proposing it one way or the other. I'm just simply saying that depression and anxiety should not keep us away from the church, but drive us to it. And prayer is a tool God gives us to find grace in our time of need. Medicine, yeah, that might be helpful, but prayer is essential. Don't forget that. She continues, These two reasons for being labeled as a bad Christian turn me off from organized religion so much. I'm faithful 100% to God. Now notice that's the second time she said that. It's a sandwich. She says that in the beginning and now towards the end of the article. But that doesn't mean I have to be an to be to an organized religion. Go ahead and label me whatever you want. But as a Christian, is it really in our place to be judgmental and labeling like this? End quote. Well, I think her perspective is completely off. It's completely off center of what a Christian mindset should be relating to the church, or what she is calling organized religion. People's labels shouldn't have anything to do with whether or not we go to church. Christians rarely attend church. Sunday worship. The Lord's Day, as we call it, because they understand what it costs Christ to form his church, to build it up. Husbands, love your wives, Paul says, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's the cross, the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5.25. Christ is head over the church, which is his body, Ephesians 1.22. As such, his body, his bride, is not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. We read in Hebrews 20, 25. Because Christians have been forgiven much, they joyfully come together each week to praise and worship their loving Savior. But they also understand that church is where they are able to serve others in the body with the gifts that the Lord has given to them. And they do that in obedience to his commands, as they see them in Romans 12, 4 through 8. Within the church, we are able to exercise an affectionate care and watchfulness over one another faithfully working together for the edification, comforting, and equipping of one another to be steadfast in our fight against sin and exhort it in spreading the gospel to others. In our services, we participate in the two sacraments that Christ instituted for us, baptism and communion. It is then when we are gathered together as the body of Christ that we participate together in these sacraments, remembering all that he has accomplished for us. Folks, biblical Christianity is not a lone ranger type thing. It's an assembly of the redeemed, mutually worshiping, praising, and serving one another in community in obedience to our risen Lord, much of which we can, cannot faithfully or obediently do if we are not present on Sunday morning. So, are you a good Christian or a bad one? How can we tell? Well, what does the Bible teach? A good Christian walks in humble obedience to Christ and his commands, confesses his sin when necessary, which is daily, and worships God in spirit and truth, persevering in the faith until he comes again. Folks, until next time, we walk by faith and not by sight.